Roses are red, Segas are blue. Omae wa mo shinderu. Double dumbass on you! What's this? A pair of games with both a reasonable level of challenge and a reasonable learning curve? Why, that doesn't seem like Sega at all. And yet, here we are. We begin with Action Fighter, which comes to Master System unsurprisingly from arcades. Now you may be surprised by the fact that Action Fighter on Master System does not represent a massive downgrade from its source material. Although this version of the game differs from the original in many respects, I'd argue that those changes all worked out for the better. No doubt it helps that Action Fighter shipped on a cartridge rather than a tiny Sega card, but even so it drops a few features from the arcade game and makes some revisions to the central play mechanics. In this case though, the features that didn't make it into the cart simply make the resulting game more streamlined, and the design changes give it a more focused central hook. In arcades, Action Fighter more or less amounted to a blatant Spy Hunter clone. Players controlled a vehicle that could shoot enemies, and they could drive through tunnels where they would transfer into different vehicles, which changed up the gameplay to different degrees. It was a fast, challenging, intense game, but it lacked a certain something, that special quality that would have put it in the upper echelons of Sega arcade releases. The home version plays like a proper second draft, giving the action a stronger sense of purpose, culling elements that didn't quite click the first time around, and introducing a more compelling central action loop. In the arcade version, players had a certain amount of control over their transformations. Every minute or so, they'd receive a notification that the road was about to split, and that they could change to a different vehicular form depending on which branch they took. As a bit for novelty, it worked pretty well. It let players gravitate toward their favorite game styles, while also adding a replay incentive that promising the opportunity of a different experience by selecting different road branches. But it also felt kind of pointless, a gimmick for gimmickry's sake, and some of the vehicular forms, particularly the dune buggy, feel like a letdown compared to others. Action Fighter on Master System trims the excess fat and ends up being far better for it. It strips the player of a certain degree of agency, in that the road forks but never actually branches, and your vehicle has a more limited and strictly predetermined transformation sequence. The decision to take options away from the player would have been a huge mistake had that been the extent of Action Fighter's revisions, but Sega's home development team kept right on going with their changes. Now, the entire game consists of five missions, each with a fixed sequence of events, core objectives, and a boss to defeat. The Master System port loses several of the arcade version's vehicles, reducing your options to motorcycle, sedan, and jet. The resulting sequence really leans into the idea of you playing as a James Bond-style secret agent, though not British since your mission briefings are all signed by President. As you no longer switch to different vehicles, but rather drive a single machine that possesses the ability to transform. The Action Fighter team appears to have been huffing the same supply as the crew behind Transbot, because they also integrated an alphanumeric power-up system to dictate your transformation process. This one works a lot better though. Rather than activating a roulette that may or may not land on the weapon setup that you want, the letter icons here simply stack in sequence as you collect them. Once you've acquired A through D, your tiny, fragile motorcycle will upgrade to an armored sedan, which has reduced maneuverability and a slightly larger hitbox compared to the bike, but can also recover from a collision, Monaco GP or road fighter style. Once in car form, you can freely transform back into a bike, if you inexplicably want to. But your real goal is to gather two more icons, E and F. Once you have these, your sedan will upgrade itself into a flying jet car at the next bridge you encounter, sending you into an aerial mode that plays like, you guessed it, Zevius. From here the game alternates between road-based and aerial sections, each of which plays differently than the other. The ground sections give you control over your forward momentum, and remind me a lot of the SG-1000 port of Monaco GP, with a touch of Konami's Road Fighter and, yes, Spy Hunter. As much as the arcade game blatantly lifted most of its design from Spy Hunter, the home game borrows even more openly. For starters, you can now upgrade your road vehicle's weapons loadout by driving into the open trailer of the Sega trucks that drive past. These will transform your puny dual machine guns into a pair of twin missiles that will take out just about every target they strike in a single shot. You can also acquire a secondary weapon, a ground-to-air missile that allows you to down the helicopters that hover overhead and attempt to bomb you. Without the missile, you're stuck adjusting your speed and position to prevent the chopper from lining up with you. See, rather than auto-scrolling, Action Fighter allows you to determine the speed of the action with a really nicely designed speed system that feels a lot more player-friendly than any home Sega driving title we've seen to date on any system. Pressing up or down on the D-pad allows you to accelerate or decelerate, but once you've reached your preferred cruising speed, 
you don't need to continue pressing the gas. By altering your speed like this, you can take a tactical approach to the road. Pull ahead of enemies to avoid being hit from behind, evade the chopper, slow down to manage tricky curves, or decelerate to maneuver yourself behind the Sega truck. It doesn't pay to dawdle though, because slow driving poses a greater risk than the mere possibility of an enemy car smashing into you from behind. See, the thing about Action Fighter on Master System is that you don't have to worry about running out of lives, at least not at first. When the game begins, you have unlimited bikes or cars or jets at your disposal. Crash? Explode? No problem. You'll simply return to the nearest checkpoint and motor on ahead. This mechanic comes straight out of Spy Hunter, and precisely as in that game, your immortality lasts only as long as the timer at the bottom corner of the screen. Once the game begins, a meter begins to run rapidly down from 999, and once it hits zero, your grace period ends. Action Fighter only allows you to lose three more vehicles once time ends, and then that's the end of the game. Generally speaking, you don't have quite enough time on the meter to reach the end of a stage without exposing your strategic vehicle reserve, at least not without cheating. So it behooves you to play aggressively and attempt to collect upgrades A through F as quickly as possible. The sooner you can transform into a jet car, the more time you have to take on the challenging aerial shooter sequences with a stock of near limitless lives. Again, exactly like Spy Hunter, where you could eventually ditch your sports coupe for a boat. One key detail makes Action Fighter a more forgiving and generally enjoyable game than its inspiration though, a mission structure. Action Fighter plays out across five stages, and each time you begin a new level, the timer begins anew. Your stock of reserve cars does not. Every car you lose once the timer ends in one mission carries forward to when the timer ends in the next. So, the more effectively and safely you play in the early stages, the more lives you have to work with in the difficult later missions. And no question about it, Action Fighter gets pretty tough. Enemy patterns become far faster and more convoluted in the auto-scrolling aerial sequences, eventually forcing you to contend with you-seeking missiles fired from off-screen straight out of Zaxxon, while the ground sequences roads branch and bend more dangerously as you clear each mission. In a genuine miracle of clemency that seems almost totally unlike the Sega we've seen so far on Master System, Action Fighter's code contains a number of cheat codes that you can input at the name entry screen. These yield different results, ranging from a quick upgrade at the game's outset to granting you invincibility to projectiles in the aerial sequences. It's weird to see Sega being so nice to players. One assumes the programmers responsible were sacked soon after. The game falls into a steady rhythm, alternating between ground and sky stages. Where one stage ends, the next begins. You complete mission one in the air, taking out a trio of battleships with your Zevius bombs, and mission two begins from there. Midway through that stage, you shift back to the ground and eventually make your way to a sextet of tanks that you need to fight in car form. And so on. Overall, Action Fighter hits Master System as a generous, well-crafted shooter that improves on the arcade game by tearing away the inessential components and creating a greater, more refined sense of purpose. Although it may not quite be the direct arcade adaptation fans expect from Sega, you'd see a lot more total home overhauls like this on Nintendo's console, it plays so well that you can't really complain. And along with Fantasy Zone, it ably demonstrates the fact that the Master System can host great interpretations of System 16 games despite the hardware downgrade. That makes it a strong, if generally overlooked, early release for the console. Finally, the video game that dares to ask, what if Bruce Lee were the Japanese Mad Max and could explode people with Chinese acupressure? And then it takes the answers and scrambles them up to avoid a copyright infringement. Yes, it's Black Belt, a game that, despite its localization team's best efforts, couldn't quite scrub the telltale signs of the property to which the Japanese version tied. Fist of the North Star, aka Hokuto no Ken, Buronsen and Tetsuo Hara's classic manga about men exploding bloodily in a post-apocalyptic desert. This was one of the very first video game adaptations of the work, a property that seems to have been custom made to be turned into video games. I mean, the manga debuted in 1983, a year before Irem shipped Kung Fu for arcades. That also was a game about punching generic goons to death before fighting BV bosses. And the Fist of the North Star property has unsurprisingly been a mainstay of the medium ever since, most recently appearing, bizarrely enough, as a fitness game for Nintendo Switch. Black Belt's US release also places it as one of the very first video games to be adapted from manga to reach American consoles. Sega shipped it a matter of weeks after Bandai had published Chubby Cherub and Ninja Kid for NES, 
meaning that in the autumn of 1986, American kids were absolutely feasting on mediocre games based on foreign properties that had been hastily scrubbed away and for whose original works they didn't have the necessary media context to understand anyway. Not that it's really fair to group Black Belt with the likes of Chubby Cherub or even Ninja Kid. On a technical level alone, it absolutely blows away either of those two games. Even if the Western release loses the visual excellence and impressive parallax scrolling of the Mark III cartridge, along with the original property. Sources like Sega Retro and Hardcore Gaming 101 cite Yuji Naka as the original programmer of Black Belt, and here he put his technical skill to more benevolent purposes than whatever the hell he seems to have had in mind for F-16 Fighting Falcon. Instead of stretching the hardware in strange directions to take advantage of its least practical and even most theoretical capabilities, here he simply built a rock-solid kung fu clone. Again, look back to 1986 as both Master System and the NES began to show up on store shelves nationwide in the US after several years of console gaming drought, and Sega's lineup makes a convincing argument to buy into their system. Nintendo had programmed the NES port of Kung Fu internally, or with the help of Toshihiko Nakago from Systems Research and Development, which amounts to the same thing, and that game ruled. It looked great, played smoothly, and even featured sampled voices. Black Belt goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with it, perhaps moving with infinitesimally less precision, but boasting varied backgrounds and much more dynamic boss encounters. Plus, Kung Fu doesn't have the feature that when you beat a boss, your protagonist goes into overdrive, suddenly shifting into automatic mode and pummeling the crap out of their foe in a blur of punches and kicks. That also ruled. And in 1986, so few American kids knew about the existence of Fist of the North Star and recognized this as a hastily reworked take on that series as to be effectively zero. Again, Fist of the North Star began its manga run in 1983 and wrapped up about five years later, which means that the Mark III version of the game shipped concurrently with the comics run. As such, it doesn't encompass the entirety of the property, instead taking players to the midpoint of the saga and the battle versus the wasteland warlord Rao. In the US, Fist of the North Star wouldn't show up until the manga had completed its run in 1989, courtesy of Viz. Taxan and Electrobrain would ship tie-in releases for NES and Game Boy with the license intact, but frankly neither game stands up to the Mark III release. We did not get the Mark III release, but even in the expurgated American Master System localization, you can easily recognize the beats of the original work. Each stage encompasses a single destination on protagonist Kenshiro's journey through the dusty ruins of Japan, culminating in a fight versus one of the warlords of the realm. Stage 1 leads to an encounter with Shin, stage 2 is the colonel, and so forth, eventually leading to a showdown with Rao after a brutal boss rush. Unlike the later Game Boy title, which played as a primitive one-on-one -on -one fighting game, the Mark III game takes its cues from the aforementioned Kung Fu and consists of fighting your way through waves of identical nameless mooks en route to each boss. Each stage has a set of checkpoints in the form of mini-bosses, who are based on the more unique foes Ken fights in the manga. Before you face Shin, for example, you have to battle Spade, who throws axes that you can punch out of the air, Diamond, who tosses spears, and Heart, Beginning with Heart, defeating many of the Mark III bosses and sub-bosses comes down to your familiarity with the source material. For example, you can only defeat Heart by striking him four times in rapid succession. Sheen's only weakness is his chest. The Colonel has to be kicked in the face, and so forth. In short, Sega put together an impressively faithful interpretation of the manga for Mark III, and they went to surprising lengths in order to localize the game for Master System. Where Bandai just slapped new non-infringing sprites into their Obake no Kyutaro and Gegege no Kitaro Famicom releases for NES, Sega greatly overhauled this Master System game. Kenshiro now appears as a generic looking karate guy named Riki, who appears to be akin to Ryu from Street Fighter or Akira from Virtua Fighter, though of course Black Belt predates both. So it's more like he's straight out of Karataka or ER Kung Fu or Karate Champ or... you get the point. More than just Kenshiro's sprite has changed here, though. Every stage has been redrawn. Rather than spanning a nuked-out version of Japan, Black Belt takes place against a backdrop of modern cityscapes that appear to be perfectly normal outside of the roaming gangs that attack wandering martial artists in droves. Enemies wear new sprites here, too, with Red Berets now appearing as bike punks, and every boss looking completely different from their manga iterations. Some stages and battles work differently, too, with the variable scenery from the second stage on Mark III giving way to basic flat ground and specific boss weaknesses being minimized. You'll see this as early as the first stage, where Heart requires four rapid strikes to defeat in Japan, while you just have to hit his American equivalent four times, period. Even the title screen shows a remarkable amount of care. The protagonist still resembles Kenshiro in the face, but he wears a different outfit and stands in a different pose. Sega rebalanced the game too, 
The US release dispenses power-ups far more generously than the Mark III game, as random pieces of sushi fly across the top of the screen from time to time, which you can leap to catch with a high jump and consume to top off your health. It even has a built-in cheat for infinite lives, which only works on Master System consoles due to its reliance on the reset button, a feature the Mark III lacks. Sega made a real effort here, and while the American release certainly loses something, it still holds up well and presents a fascinating case study in its own right. I mean, Sega clearly produced this version for international markets, but the American release still feels like an import game. Besides the newly added Japanese snacks, it also throws in new Japanese language text, with the manga quotes that display when you defeat a boss having been changed to different unlocalized kanji. And if you do know the material, you can still see the outlines of Fist of the North Star shining through. Localized protagonist Riki still uses Hokuto no Ken techniques, the bad guys mostly still use their same combat styles, and vanquished rabble explode when defeated, albeit non-bloodily, instead disintegrating into their constituent sprites. On Mark III, Fist of the North Star stands out as by far the best and most faithful manga to console game adaptation ever seen to that point. It really does a fantastic job of distilling the beats and overall style of one of manga's most influential creations into the shape of a kung fu clone. Granted, you do lose a lot of the story's nuance and translation to a simple walk and punch game, in the manga, Kenshiro doesn't simply live to detonate random punks in the desert. He fights for justice, and the original manga justifies the extreme gore resulting from his brutal combat techniques by showcasing the cruelty of his foes and his own keen sense of determination to protect the weak and innocent. On Master System, though, Black Belt loses almost all of that. It feels slightly stranded in history, a licensed game that appeared before Americans had access to that property. But it does play well for a game of its era, and it compares favorably to Kung Fu on NES. Ultimately, I think Black Belt works best if you read it as an apology for my hero. No, really, Master System can support good brawlers, and Sega knows how to make them, it says. It does make you wonder why they even bothered with that My Card game if Black Belt was slated to show up just a couple of months later. But hey, it's not like competing systems didn't contain equally baffling software choices. I mean, My Hero on Master System was a dud, but it was still more fun than Stack Up. Next time on Sega Iden, those pretzel wheels never stood a chance.